previous lecture we had familiarized our menu plate files and directories how to create files how to edit their content and so on and so forth i hope that you have also tried these things after the lecture and are now comfortable using the linux environment in this lecture we will look at the basic components of a computer and try to understand how it works at a very low level a computer consists of a very large number of complex electronic circuits but we are interested in this lecture in a more abstract higher level view of the computer so let's look at what the main components of a computer at this high level are the first component is a system bus which connects all the other major components of the computer you can think of this bus as uh, the nervous system of the computer which transmits signal from one place to the other the two most important components are the cpu and the memory the cpu stands for central processing unit and it is this circuit which executes and understands all programs that the computer executes the memory stores all data that is needed to run these programs we will look at some details of the memory and the cpu uh, shortly apart from the cpu and memory the computer also has a number of input output devices some of which we have already come across in the previous lecture for example we are already familiar with the keyboard the mouse and the monitor there are two more io devices namely the hard disk and the cd rom drive both of these are mass storage media that is they can store large volumes of data for a long time these are in contrast with memory the memory is uh, much smaller in size as compared to the hard disk and cd rom drive but is much quicker to access for the central processing unit also an important difference between memory and hard disk and cd rom drive is that the data in memory is volatile what this means is that if the power is switched off the data is erased whereas the data stored on the hard disk and the cd rom drive remains even if the power to the computer is switched off so all the files and directories that we had talked about in the last lecture are actually stored on the hard disk and the cd rom drive let's first discuss the memory in some detail memory is essentially a correct collection of a large number of memory cells and each cell can store what is known as a bit a bit is a binary digit which means that its value is either 0 or 1 and the memory of a computer is nothing but a collection of a large number of memory cells each of which can store just one bit that is either 0 or 1 and the reason for this uh, storing bit is that the current electronic technology is transistor based and transistors can be in two states either on or off and the two states essentially represent the numbers 0 or 1 for efficiency data is usually accessed from the memory in terms of bytes that is group of 8 bits which is known as a byte is accessed at one time data may also be accessed from memory in larger units for example 2 bytes or 4 bytes or on some computers even 8 bytes now you can see that the memory consists of a large number of bytes so for example you might have heard the term that a computer has 256 megabytes of memory what that means is that in this computer the number of bytes in the memory is 256 into 2 to the power 20 roughly speaking this is 256 million bytes so when the cpu needs to access a particular byte of data from the memory it has to specify to the memory circuit somehow which byte out of these 256 million bytes it wants to access and for this reason every byte has a distinct address so the addresses of these bytes would start from 0 1 2 and go up to 256 million or so it's important to note that both programs as well as the data for these programs is stored in memory so as you can see that since at the lowest level we can only store zeros and ones in memory it is necessary that all the kinds of data that we are interested in dealing with are represented as sequences of just zeros and ones so we need encoding for all kinds of data such as integers real numbers characters and so on and so forth 
So in this lecture, we'll only look at the uh, coding used for integers, and we'll not right now talk about then codings used for real numbers and text characters and so on. We will talk about them in subsequent lecture. So let's look at how integers are represented inside a computer. So we are dealing only with non-negative integers. As you know, any integer can be converted to its binary representation, that is the base 2 representation, which then becomes just a sequence of zeros and ones. For example, 113 dec the no decimal number 113, when represented in binary, is 1110001, and you can verify this. because as you can see this binary number in decimal is equivalent to 1 into 2 to the power 6 plus 1 into 2 to the power 5 etc up to 1 into 2 to the power 0 this is because the binary system is a positional system and this entire expression evaluates to the number 113 but what if we want to represent both positive as well as negative numbers one possible way is that out of the number of bits available to us, we use one of the bits to store or represent the sign of the number, that is plus or minus. So, for example, we can have the convention that if the leftmost bit is 1, that denotes a negative number, and if it is 0, then it denotes a positive number, and the rest of the bits give the magnitude of the number. Given this information, you can observe some facts. If we are using 8 bits to represent an integer and let us say we are representing only non-negative integers, then the largest integer that we can store would be 255. Why is that? Because the largest binary number in 8 bits that we can have is 11178 times and which in decimal is equal to 255. And if we are storing both positive and negative numbers, then we have to use one bit for the sign which means we have only seven bits for the magnitude in, and in this case the maximum positive number that we will be able to store will be 127 which is 2 to the power 7 minus 1 and as you can see that if we just use one byte for storing an integer we cannot store a very large range of integers and therefore usually a number of bytes are actually used to store single in, a single integer. Typically, most computers would use a group of consecutive 4 bytes in memory to store an integer. So, 4 bytes means 32 bits because each byte is 8 bits, which means that if we are storing both positive and negative numbers, 31 bits are used for the magnitude and which means in turn that the largest positive number that we can store is 2 to the power 31 minus 1. Okay, let's now come to the CPU. The CPU, as I said, is the brain of the computer. It is the component that understands and executes our program. However, CPU can understand and execute only very simple instructions of the kind, add A1, comma A2, comma A3. In this example, what this instruction represents is the instruction to the computer to add the contents of the memory location whose addresses are A1 and A2 respectively, add these two values and store the result in the third memory location whose address is A3. So, instructions of this kind constitute the machine language of the CPU and the CPU can only understand and execute programs which are written in this machine language. So, as you can imagine, writing even reasonably complicated programs in such a language is an extremely cumbersome task. For example, try to imagine what a program for computing the factorial in uh, machine language would look like. We would have to worry about what addresses to assign to various variables and we would not be able to use high level instructions such as loops and assignments and so on and so forth. And therefore, we require some tools so that the task of programming is somewhat easier. And that's the role of what are known as high level programming languages. The high level programming languages make programming easier because they offer higher level or more abstract programming constructs such as variables. We have already seen what these variables are. There are other high level abstract 
constructs that programming languages offer that we'll see throughout this course. There are a large number of high level programming languages which have been in use over a number of years. For example, C, Fortran, Java and so on and so forth. In this particular course, we will learn the programming language C. But please note that the focus of this course is on learning the concepts of programming. The, pro the choice of programming language is only a vehicle to actually implement those concepts in practice. So, even though we are learning C in this course, you might actually be required to write programs later on in your professional career in other programming languages, possibly Fortran or Java. But having learned the concepts of programming, you will find that it will not be a very difficult task to migrate from C to some other programming language. Now the problem is that programs written in these high level programming languages cannot be directly understood by the machine and therefore we need some tools using which we can actually run these programs and that's where tools called compilers come in. So a compiler essentially translates a program in a high level language such as C to an equivalent machine language program for a particular kind of a CPU. So a compiler as you can see is specific to both the high level language that it translates from and to the kind of CPU whose machine language it translates the program to. So this program called a compiler automatically performs the translation from a high level language to the machine language of the computer. So therefore, when we write a program, we will write it in a high level language. In this course, we will write all our programs in C. Then we will compile it using a compiler for this language. So in this course, we will use a C compiler. And then we will execute the generated machine language program. The compiler will automatically translate our C program into the machine language program for our computer. And this machine language program that we will be able to execute directly on the computer. And it will have the same effect as what we intended in our C program. So let us now see what the factorial program written in C looks like. So I have already written this program and let us edit this file fact.c which contains the C program for computing factorial and this is what it looks like. In this lecture we will not go into the details of the C syntax but you can still note that this program in C looks very similar to the algorithm that we had written informally. So here we are saying that while n is greater than 1, we have to repeat these two statements. Note that the assignment operation in C is denoted by an equal sign. So this particular statement result is equal to result star n should actually be read as result assigned result star n. Like the equal symbol here denotes not equality but assignment. So therefore saying that result is equal to result star n does make sense and doesn't mean that n is necessarily 1. And similarly in the, in the next line we are not stating or claiming that n is equal to n minus 1 which is of course absurd. We are saying that the new value of n becomes the old value of n minus 1. Here we are initializing result to 1. Here we are reading the value of n. We will see the details of all these statements later on in the course and here we are finally printing the value of the result. So let us now actually compile this program and try to run it. To compile this program we need to use the C compiler and the command for the C compiler is cc. So the arguments that I have given to the cc command are first of all minus o. Minus o says that the equivalent machine language program which is generated for this C program should go in the file which is named after minus O. So what this is saying is that the generated machine language program for computed factorial should be stored in a file called fact and fact.c is the name of the file which contains the C program for computing the factorial. It is a convention that the names of all files containing C program end in .c. So let's just execute this this command by hitting the return key. So we did not get any error messages, which means that the compiler accepted our program. And now 
you can check that a file called fact has been generated and this file actually contains the machine language program which is equivalent to the C program that we wrote for computing factorial. Let's now execute this program. So since this is in the current directory, the relative path to this file is dot slash fact and to execute this program I just need to give the command dot slash fact and when I hit enter actually nothing happens and this is so because the program is waiting for us to type a number whose factorial is to be computed. So let's enter some number, let us say 5, hit the enter or the return key and the result which is 120 is printed. Let's try it with some more numbers. So this is the factorial of 14. Let's try to compute the factorial of 20 and you see that the output is a negative number. This is obviously wrong and this has happened because the factorial of 20 is too large to be stored in an integer. In this machine, the representation of an, an integer uses 4 bytes, that means 32 bits and since both positive and negative integers are represented, that means the largest positive number that we can represent in this notation is 2 to the power 31 minus 1 and the factorial of 20 actually happens to be much larger than this number that is 2 to the power 31 minus 1 and therefore we are getting some nonsensical results. In this lecture we have looked at the basic components of the computer and how they interact with each other. We also saw the notions of machine language and high level languages and the role of compiler and finally we saw our first C program and we saw how to compile and execute this program. From the next lecture onwards we will start looking at the C language in more detail and start developing programs which are somewhat more complex than the simple C program that we have seen so far. Thank you.